Uh, it is my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Manuel Rodriguez Concepcion. Um, so just a brief information about uh, Manuel. He uh, received his uh, PhD in 1995 from um, in, in Valencia from now the IBMCP, so the same institute that uh, he is currently working. And then in 1996, uh, he moved to California, to um, <clears throat> Berkeley University. And then there he started developing his interest about uh, isoprenoids and carotenoids. And then in 1999, he moved back to, to Spain um, in the Universidad of Barcelona. Uh, and then in 2001, he got a very prestigious um, grant, Ramon, Ramon y Cajal, where uh, he was um, able to start his own independent research. And then in um, 2006, he joined um, the, the, what we, the, the shortcut is CRAC, the, the Center uh, for Genomic Regulation, I think. And um, he joined as an assistant professor. And then in 2010, um, he received, or he, he was uh, promoted to um, associate professor. Uh, and then lately in two, 2020, full professor. And one year later, 2021, he moved to the IBMCP, the Institute for Plant Molecular and Cell Biology in Valencia. And now he is uh, currently working there as a full professor. And today uh, he is going to talk about uh, novel strategies to optimize carotenoid production and storage in plants. So the stage is yours, Manuel, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Juanca. Thank you for the for the uh, invitation and the opportunity that you give me to work to talk about the work that we are doing here in Valencia. But as you said, uh, I spent a long time in in Barcelona in the Center for Research in Agricultural Genomics, and many of the results I'm going to present today were actually uh, you know obtained here in, in this center. Uh, basically, that corresponds to the published work I'm going to uh, present today. But in 2020, as you were saying, I moved to Valencia, to the IBNCP, where I am uh, currently uh, working basically uh, on the same subject. This is my group here and my funding sources. Uh, so, okay, let's start with the science. As you know, I'm working with crotonoids, and crotonoids are important from the nutritional uh, point of view. And you also may know that the United Nations has established uh, several sustainable uh, development uh, goals for the future, and two of them have to do with uh, nutrition, our uh, goals number two and number three. Those two goals uh, target the what is called the triple burden of malnutrition. Basically, three major uh, areas. Undernutrition, people who don't get enough food. Overweight, which is like the opposite, people who get more than enough food and excess food. And another important area is micronutrient deficiency. And this is probably the one um, impacting more people in the world because not only includes people who do not get enough food, but also people that do not get uh, enough variety in their foods that they uh, come up with a, a micronutrient uh, deficiency. So these two sustainable development goals target uh, these problems, and in particular, uh, micronutrition, uh, micronutrition uh, deficiency could be, you know, uh, fought by or uh, different strategies. One of them is the, uh, dietary diversification. We can eat more, uh, more varied uh, food, more varied diet. Another way of, uh, uh, you know, fixing this problem would be supplementing the food with uh, something like food fortification, supplementing it with vitamins or with micronutrients that we don't have enough in the food. Another way would be to take dietary supplements, but the, um, our favorite option is biofortification, which is the increase in the uh, amount of these important micronutrients directly in the food sources that we eat in the plants in our case. And in particular, we are uh, targeting the uh, fortification, the biofortification of carotenoids in plant tissues. 
So what are carotenoids? You probably heard about carotenoids more than once in, 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 in that institute, but I'm gonna remind you like the, the, the major, uh, you know, the take home messages regarding carotenoids uh, in function and, uh, you know, utility. Carotenoids were invented when photosynthesis was invented. They are actually very important for photosynthesis. As you know, photosynthesis is uh, the process by which CO2 is fixed into carbon that supports the growth of photosynthetic organisms and from there everything else that consumes photosynthetic organisms with the side production of oxygen and this is a process that is uh, you know powered by sunlight when photosynthesis works well under optimal light condition everything everybody's happy let's say i mean we have reducing powers we have energy we have sugars and plants grow however when uh, light is in excess uh, then problems can be uh, in, in, in the horizon. Uh, specifically, uh, reactive oxygen species of different types can be uh, forming in, in leaves, in photosynthetic tissues, and this may cause bleaching and eventually uh, lead to cell death. So plants need to fight this excess uh, sunlight with photoprotective uh, mechanisms. There are several uh, mechanisms that uh, try to uh, protect plants against this excess light and against this uh, reactive oxygen species. One of them, or one group of them, uh, would be physical photoprotection mechanism, like moving leaves or chloroplasts away from the light, or building chemical screens, like with uh, anthocyanins, to filter light and to uh, reduce the intensity of the light that reaches the photosynthetic apparatus. Another group of uh, solutions would be the chemical solutions one of them would be to or actually is to release uh, as heat the excess energy that comes from the light the other one is to quench and detoxify the reactive ox oxygen species and in both chemical strategy carotenoids are essential and this is well illustrated by this picture in which we have applied an uh, inhibitor of carotenoid biosynthesis to the leaves of this Arabidopsis plant. As you can see here, the leaves that cannot produce carotenoids become completely bleached in the light and their photosynthetic systems are completely uh, gone. So this uh, is a, a good example of how carotenoids are uh, absolutely essential, essential for plants for photoprotection and they also contribute to photosynthesis because they are also important for the assembly of the photosynthetic apparatus. This is probably not the most famous role. Uh, they are better known for their pigmentation properties. Carotenoids are pigments in the yellow, orange, and red uh, range. And many flowers, fruits, seeds, and roots are stained with the colors of uh, carotenoids. In many of these cases, non-photosynthetic uh, tissues uh, what happens is that the carotenoids accumulate in a particular type of plastic called the chromoplast. Chromoplast mm, might differentiate from chloroplast. For instance, this is what happens during tomato uh, fruit ripening. And in this case, the, the, the typical uh, photosynthetic structures that define uh, a chloroplast, like thylakoids and grana, are uh, disintegrated and new membrane systems, vesicle systems, and uh, storage structures for lipophilic compounds such as carotenoids develop, forming what we call generally uh, chromoplast. Carotenoids are also present in leaves. As I said, they are also they are very important for photosynthesis and photoprotection, but we don't see them because chlorophylls are present. Only when chlorophylls are degraded, for instance, during the autumn in many, in many trees, we can see the true colors of carotenoids. In this case, however, in leaves, this is not a chromoplastogenesis uh, process. It's not a conversion of chloroplast into chromoplast, but into a different type of plastic, the gerontoplast, and does not involve chlorophyll, uh, uh, sorry, chlorophyll, uh, sorry, carotenoid overaccumulation. It involves chlorophyll degradation, but carotenoid levels stay the same or even decrease, and chromoplasts are not formed. Okay, carotenoids are also important from the signaling point of view. Their degradation products can uh, produce aromas that communicate plants with their environment. They can also produce uh, retrograde signals and hormones such as ABA and strigolactones, as you know very well uh, there. 
Okay, what do we care about carotenoids? Carotenoids are very important from the uh, industrial point of view. The cosmetic and agrofood industry use uh, large amounts of carotenoids as natural pigments. But they're also uh, very important food quality parameters. Uh, they are important for the color of uh, many fruits and vegetables, and they are the main source of uh, vitamin E, A, uh, vitamin A. In particular, uh, beta-carotene is the main precursor of, of uh, vitamin A because the cleavage of beta-carotene in the, in the middle of the molecule produces exactly two molecules of uh, vitamin A. Carotene are also uh, very uh, well-known promoters of uh, good health. They prevent several types of diseases like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, obesity, uh, macular degeneration or sunburn. And they also promote uh, health as antioxidants and immune enhancers. So they are basically good uh, micronutrients to target by this uh, sustainable development goals strategy. Most of the carotenoids used um, by the industry are produced by chemical synthesis. Some of them are purified from natural sources, but the alternative, which is the biotechnological production of carotenoids. We can produce carotenoids in bacteria and also plants and, you know, take the, the carotenoids from there and use them for the, you know, for cosmetics or for the as natural pigments or as dietary, dietary uh, supplements. But you can also uh, directly buy a fortified plants with carotenoids to increase the accumulation of carotenoids in, in plants. And this is the main subject of our work. Uh, there are several uh, examples of successful uh, biofortification uh, of carotenoids. The, probably the, the best uh, examples are the ones achieved in tissues that are not non-photosynthetic, like those in fruits uh, and seeds. One of the most famous one, of course, is the golden rice that was able to create carotenoids or to produce carotenoids in, an, in a tissue that was not naturally producing carotenoids. And this illustrates the very large plasticity that plastids have to accumulate carotenoids, provided that they develop um, uh, appropriate storage structure and that they produce enough levels of carotenoids. So let's do it. Let's 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 increase the amount of carotenoids in in plants. We can do it, but there are problems still yet to be resolved. Uh, one of them is that the, the carotenoid pathway, as you will see in a minute, is a very interconnected pathway. There are many pathways sharing precursors and using the substrates that carotenoids use to be produced. The storage is also uh, uh, another problem. In order to produce high levels of carotenoids, you need to have uh, appropriate storage structures. Um, Probably one of the main uh, issues is that we still know relatively little about the re regulatory mechanisms uh, controlling the levels and activity of the enzymes. Uh, all these problems together end up uh, resulting in unpredicted uh, results in many cases, including uh, golden rice. So we are targeting, uh, our research is targeting these problems in order to know a little bit better how to uh, produce carotenoids uh, in plants in a safe way. Okay, so this is like uh, uh, a schematic representation of the how carotenoids are produced in, in plastids. Carotenoids are isoprenoids, and as all isoprenoids, they derive from precursors produced by the material retritol 4 phosphate pathway or the MET pathway. These precursors are used for the production of other uh, isoprenoids. For instance, they are uh, used for the uh, biosynthesis of the isoprenoid chains of chlorophylls, phylloquinone and plastoquinone that are important uh, molecules for photosynthesis. They are also formed to produce tocopherols and carotenoids, which are uh, photoprotectants and very powerful uh, antioxidants that protect plants uh, and uh, isoprenoids are also retrograde signals that can travel from the plastic to the nucleus in order to, uh, you know, um, regulate uh, metabolic homeostasis. Isoprenoids can also be uh, hormones that communicate different parts of the plants in order to coordinate plant uh, and responses to the environment. And isoprenoids are also secondary metabolites that regulate the interaction of plants with other plants and with other mechanisms, with other organisms 
in, in their environment. And as supplements can also be useful for us as a healthy uh, micronutrients. For instance, two, uh, three, sorry, three groups of isoprenoids are vitamins. Philokinone is vitamin K, tocopherols are vitamin E, and carotenoids in particular, uh, beta-carotene are uh, vitamin A. And the deficiency vitamin A is uh, particularly uh, important because it uh, results in important diseases, uh, site-related uh, diseases and developmental defects. So, uh, you know, ensuring a diet uh, with enough vitamin A is, is important to avoid uh, these micronutrient uh, deficiencies. Okay. Uh, we have the, our work and the work of other labs in, in, in the last years have established what are the enzymes that are important to regulate the flux, the metabolic flux through these pathways. And two of the most important enzymes in this, uh, in this regulation are the excess, the oxycellulose 5-phosphate synthase, the first enzyme of the MEP pathway, and also PSY phytoin synthase, the first enzyme of the carotenoid pathway. By overexpressing these enzymes, we get an in increased flux through this pathway and an increased accumulation of final products. This works reasonably well in uh, non-photosynthetic tissues, but in photosynthetic tissues, what we have observed that the, the, the transient or stable overexpression of these two enzymes does result in increased levels of the final products, but only in modest increases. We don't, we don't reach very high levels, very likely because these, uh, and, uh, these uh, metabolites are important for photosynthesis. And you know, in, in photosynthetic tissues, you don't want to get rid of photosynthesis because this is the main function of, of uh, photosynthetic tissues. But another important reason is that in these uh, photosynthetic tissues, there are uh, endogenous mechanisms that strongly regulate and very tightly regulate the accumulation of the enzymes produced from, from the uh, overexpressed genes and also the storage capacity of the plastics. So I'm going to show you some of the uh, uh, results that we uh, collected in the, in the last decade about the mechanisms that regulate enzyme levels uh, in the carotenoid pathway. This slide summarizes, as I was saying, the, the, the work of basically a decade. And this is the work that was mainly carried out by Pablo Pulido, a former postdoc in the lab, and two PhD students, Ernesto Llamas and Lucio D'Andrea. By using Arabidopsis and tomato and model systems, they uh, found that DXS and PSY, the main two rate limiting enzymes uh, uh, of the isoprenoid and carotenoid pathway, are targets of a uh, multi-protein complex called the clip protease. This uh, multi-protein uh, or multi-subunit uh, uh, protease is like a sort of proteasome in the plastid that degrades uh, several proteins, including PSY and DXS. There are evidences that other uh, enzymes of the MEP pathway and the carotenoid pathway are also uh, degraded by the clip protease, but we only have strong evidence and we even know uh, mechanistic uh, information for the excess um, and PSY. In the case of PSY, this work was in collaboration with Lily in, uh, from Cornell University and Ralph Wells in the University of Freiburg. So this is like, like, is like a summary of the uh, mechanistic view of how these uh, enzymes are degraded by the clip protease. In the case of DXS, we know that this is a soluble protein. It, it localizes in the stroma uh, of plastids, but it's very prone to, uh, to losing their active conformation and to misfold, therefore uh, losing its enzymatic activity. Misfolded uh, DXS proteins are immediately recognized by an adapter protein called J20 that the tar or delivers the protein to the HSP70 chaperone. This chaperone is able to also uh, interact with other chaperones, including CLIPC1, which is uh, one of the main chaperones of the CLIP protease that unfolds the protein for delivery into the proteolytic chamber that eventually degrades the protein. HSP70 can also interact with another chaperone, CLIPB3, which is very similar to CLIPC1, but lacks the domains that are required for interaction with CLIP protease. 
So when uh, this interaction, the clip B3 HSP7 interaction takes place, the excess is unfolded but released into the stroma, so allowing the protein to uh, spontaneously uh, be refolded into the active form of the enzyme. In the case of PSY, the mechanism is not as well established, but we know that one of the key chaperons in this mechanism is orange. Orange uh, is known to prevent the uh, misfolding of the PSY protein, which is an enzyme associated uh, with the membrane of the uh, with the membrane system of the plasmid the, of the plastid in order to be active. And as I was saying, the orange chaperon prevents the misfolding of the enzyme and promotes the formation of uh, active protein and the localization uh, of the protein to the membrane environment that is required for activity. It is very interesting that uh, this orange chaperon has been uh, well described as a promoter of chromoplast differentiation in many systems. Here I show you some examples of different labs. Uh, by promoting the activity of these chaperons, we get the, the differentiation of uh, chromoplast in lots of non-photosynthetic tissues like tomato fruit, uh, olive, uh, cauliflower, melon fruit, maize kernels, or even uh, Arabidopsis color. In Arabidopsis, there are, there are no uh, examples of natural differentiation of chromoplast, but the uh, promotion of orange activity is able to artificially produce uh, chloroplast. As I was saying, no examples of uh, or, uh, orange promoting the, the development of chromoplasts in leaves are available in the literature, but we hypothesized that maybe this was because orange could not promote an increase in PSY activity high enough to, you know, trigger the differentiation of chromoplasts. So our hypothesis at this point was that if we could increase PSY activity at levels high enough, we might be able to transform the leaf chloroplast into artificial uh, chromoplasts, similarly to what it was, it had been observed by overexpressing orange. And we also hypothesized that maybe the chromoplast, the artificial chromoplast that could be the, uh, promoted by uh, PSY over uh, hyperactivity. Or, or hyperinduction of activity in leaves, this artificial chromoplast could also be good storage organs for other lipophilic isoprenoids like vitamin K or vitamin E. And this could therefore be uh, good tools for the biofortification of leaves. Okay, so to test our hypothesis, we thought about uh, ways of promoting PSY activity in, in chromoplasts. Uh, by bypassing the regulatory constraints that prevent PSY activity to increase uh, to high levels in chloroplasts. And one of those constraints were the degradation by the clip protease. So we reasoned that maybe using enzymes that were different from the uh, canonical plant enzymes, but could perform the same activity, might you know, bypass the uh, regulatory constraints of the chloroplasts. And in particular, we uh, paid attention to this uh, CRTB uh, protein from uh, the bacteria Pantoeanonatis. This protein has been uh, widely used in the carotenoid field to, uh, as, a, as a fighting synthase of bacterial origin. But as you can see here, the structure of the protein is similar to the plant protein, but lacks some of the disorganized domains that the plant proteins have but might uh, be important for the regulation of these plant proteins. The absence of these domains in the bacterial protein led us, you know, gave us hope that this bacterial protein might uh, be produced at levels high enough and with activity high enough to, uh, tra to transform chloroplasts into chromoplasts in leaves. In order to ensure very high levels of, of these proteins in, in leaves, we use the agroinfiltration technique that, as you know, can produce very, very high levels of uh, proteins in uh, Nicopetiana uh, benthamiana leaves. So what uh, Briardo uh, Llorente, a former postdoc in the lab, did was to inoculate leaves with constructs to produce either uh, plant PSY proteins, phytosynthesis proteins, or bacterial CRTB proteins with a plastic targeting uh, peptides to deliver the protein to the plastic. And then uh, he analyzed 
the uh, accumulation of carotenoids in these different areas. As controls, he used uh, an empty constructs or uh, he uh, overexpressed GSP <clears throat> as, a, as a protein that is not uh, affecting the carotenoid levels. The, the levels of carotenoids in, in empty controls and GFP controls were exactly the same, very similar to the ones of non-agroinfiltrated tissue. When we overexpress the PS1 protein, we get an increase of about 25% in the amount of uh, carotenoids in, in this area. This is something that we expected. However, when we overexpress the bacterial protein, the increase was much higher. We also detected the accumulation of phytoin, which is the direct product of the, of the CRTB protein. And we also detected the formation of this yellow color in the areas where the protein was expressed. This yellow color was due to the increased accumulation of carotenoids, but not to the degradation of, of chlorophylls because the amount of chlorophylls in this area were very similar to uh, other uh, control areas that had also been agroinfiltrated with control proteins. The areas that were infiltrated with the bacterial protein also showed a very intense drop of photosynthesis. In here, this is a heat map of chlorophyll fluorescence for effective quantum yield of photosystem 2. And as you can see here, blue colors mean good photosynthesis, and red color means decrease or uh, almost null photosynthesis. And as you can see here, the areas uh, expressing the, the bacterial protein showed a very uh, sharp decrease in photosynthesis. And you can see here the, the same result uh, in, in a quantitative, uh, in a quantitative uh, representation. OK, so we have. Uh, the very high accumulation of carotenoids and loss of photosynthesis in this area. Are they uh, are these areas forming chromoplasts? And the answer is yes, they are forming chromoplasts. In control areas, we have mm, regular uh, chloroplasts. As you can see here, this is they are characterized by these uh, membrane systems of tilakoids and grana. This this membrane stacks called grana. Uh, in in the area overexpressing uh, the, the bacterial CRTB protein, these chloroplasts were gone, and in their place there were these plastics that we call chromoplasts, uh, like plastids or artificial chromoplasts. They are completely different from the plastids that develop in senescent leaves. They are called gerontoplasts, and as you can see here, they keep the uh, structure of the photosynthetic membranes, and they develop these very large vesicles for uh, the storage of uh, different lipophilic uh, metabolites. But in our case, the plastics that develop in this area were completely different from gerotoplasts. And I was saying they were very similar to uh, chloroplasts. On one hand, the, the, the uh, analysis of the, the, the proteins present in, in this area uh, confirmed that the uh, photosynthetic uh, apparatus was being dismantled in this uh, in this plastic. So, as uh, the in in this uh, pr uh, in this picture, I represent the, the amount of different enzymes of the photosynthetic uh, apparatus as chloroplasts are developing into chromoplasts. Different time points after agroinfiltration with the bacterial protein. And as you can see, most of these proteins show decreased levels in chromoplasts. So photosynthetic apparatus is uh, becoming uh, dismantled uh, during this process. But also, uh, it was uh, interesting to see that the amount of pastoglobules increase very much in this uh, in these plastids, and as you can see here, these are uh, proteins that are associated with plastoglobules, and all of them increased in the artificial chromoplasts that are developed in the CRTB expressing sections of of the lip. Okay, so the first. Uh, you know, we can we can say for sure that the increasing PSY uh, activity to levels high enough is sufficient to convert a chloroplast, a leaf chloroplast, into a chromoplast, an artificial chromoplast. The second question is: Can these artificial chromoplasts become storage places to uh, accumulate more of healthy uh, isoprenoids besides carotenoids? 
And to answer this question, uh, Luca Morelli, a former uh, PhD student in the lab, uh, went to Felix Kessler lab in, in Switzerland to perform a cellular or subplastidial fractionation experiments in order to analyze the uh, composition in different isoponoids of the different membrane systems of the chloroplast and the artificial chromoplast. Basically, this is a sucrose gradient that is able to separate the plastoglobulus from the envelope membranes that are marked here in, in, in uh, orange and the thylakoid uh, membranes. Uh, as you know, plastoglobulus are a particular rich in, in phylloquinone, vitamin K and tocopherols, vitamin E. To, uh, the envelope also has relatively high levels of vitamin uh, E, also contains some uh, carotenoids and phylloquinone. And thylakoids are uh, rich in, in, in vitamin E and beta carotene and other carotenoids, with also um, minor levels of vitamin K, K and vitamin E. Okay, in plastoglobulus, there are no, oh, there are very little carotenoids in, in chloroplast. So the idea was to analyze how the composition of chloroplast was being changed as this chloroplast became chromoplasts. But first, we uh, made sure that we were correctly separating the different fractions. So uh, in order to see whether the, the different fractions corresponded to the different membranes that we were uh, expecting, we used marker proteins, marker proteins of plastoglobules, of the envelope, or the uh, photosynthetic apparatus. And as you can see here, basically the first fractions of the, of the gradient did correspond to plastoglobules as expected, the fraction that we call uh, M1 uh, were enriched in envelope uh, proteins, but the, uh, and the, the fraction called M1 contained uh, the uh, uh, thylocodal uh, proteins, but we, it was also uh, enriched in uh, proteins that could also be found in the, in the envelope. Okay, sorry, I just need to change this. Okay, so basically we, our, our system succeeded in separating the different fractions of the, of the plastids. But something that uh, drew our attention was that when we localize the CRTB protein in this fraction, all the protein that was detected by the antibody was localized in the plastoglobal fraction. We confirmed the plastoglobular localization of the CRTB protein by using uh, uh, fluorescent uh, markers of plastoglobulus, uh, specifically a fibrillin, and we observed that there was a perfect uh, overlap of the two signals, meaning that the, the, the CRTB protein did localize two plastoglobulus in, in, in this uh, artificial chloroplast. So we expected that maybe the, 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 the carotenoids that were uh, accumulating in this uh, artificial chromoplast will be located in, uh, in this plastoglobular fraction. And indeed, if you can see here, this is like a, uh, the, a collection of the plastoglobular fractions uh, before agar infiltration, two days and four days after agar infiltration. As you can see here, there is a color, uh, an orange color developing in these fractions, which is consistent with the idea that maybe the carotenoids were being formed in this plastoglobulus. Also, the, the envelope and rich fraction also contains some color. So some of the carotenoids could also be going to this fraction. And in the case of the telacoids, it was very difficult to see if the uh, carotenoids were there because of the color of chlorophyll. So when we analyze the, the, the uh, composition of all these uh, fractions, we observe that uh, in chloroplast, the composition was very similar to that reported in the literature, I meaning uh, virtually no carotenoids in plastic globules, lots of uh, tocopherols in envelopes, and carotenoids also being present in the thylakoidal uh, fractions. But what happened as chloroplast became artificial chromoplast? Well, in the case of the plastoglobules, they accumulated very high levels of uh, phytoin, which is consistent with the uh, observation that CRTB is only is localized to plastoglobules. 
almost no phytoin was detected in any other fraction, okay? But it was also very interesting to see that uh, beta-carotene for vitamin A was also very highly enriched in these plaster globules. This is probably what was causing the uh, coloration of these fractions as uh, chloroplasts were being transformed into chromoplasts. These plastoglobules also contain increasing levels of vitamin K, phylloquinones, and vitamin E, tocopherols. Regarding other fractions, in the envelope uh, fractions, we also had a very large increase in carotenoids, but in this case, the carotenoid that was more highly accumulated was lutein. Lutein is a yellow carotenoid, and this explains the color of, of these fractions, okay? In the M2 fractions, we hardly saw any, any changes. So the conclusion is that the uh, subplastidal compartments that are more interesting to us are the plastoglobulus because they are the ones that show an, in, an increase in the, in the prolifer they proliferate as chloroplasts develop into chromoplasts. And they also are the main reservoirs of uh, the uh, vitamins that we are interested in, uh, in carotenoids, but also phylloquinones and tocopherols. Interestingly enough, these uh, sharp increases in uh, the production of these metab metabolites took place without major changes in the expression of the biosynthetic genes. So our conclusion is that this increase takes place because either uh, the enzymes producing these metabolites are more uh, active in the plastoglobulus that develop uh, under these conditions, or the plastoglobulus itself are, you know, uh, provide a better environment for the storage of these metabolites, preventing their degradation and providing, as I said, a good biosynthetic and storage compartment for them to, to be accumulated. In the literature, there were reports of proteins uh, involved in the production of tocopherols, vitamin E and phylloquinones, mm, vitamin K, in, in the plastoglobulus of, of chloroplasts. Uh, and there were also reports of uh, proteins regard, uh, related to uh, the production of beta-carotene in the plastoglobulus of chromoplasts. And this fits very well with what we observed in, in our data. Okay, so mm, virtually no, no uh, carotenoids in, in chloroplasts, but as chloroplasts uh, were turned into chromoplasts, all uh, the, the carotenoid pathway, or at least up to beta carotene, was being uh, building up in this plastoglobal fraction. Okay, plastoglobals are important. We can uh, uh, Accumulate, or you can, we can, uh, or plastoglobals are important for the accumulation of, of these uh, isoprenoid compounds. We can uh, enrich, we can buy fortified leaves in these uh, isoprenoid uh, vitamins by uh, promoting the differentiation of chromoplasts. But can we go further and increase the levels of these isoprenoids by further promoting the local, the, the uh, proliferation of, of uh, plastoglobals? And to test this uh, idea, we used uh, highlight because highlight is known to promote the proliferation of uh, plastic globules. So what we did was uh, we uh, agroinfiltrated leaves with the GFP control with CRTB, and also we uh, pre-incubated leaves with highlight in order to promote the, the proliferation of, of plastic globules, and then agroinfiltrate the leaf with CRTB. And as you can see here, this highlight treatment, this uh, promotion of uh, uh, plastic global development worked to increase the levels of all three vitamins, vitamin E, vitamin K, and vitamin E. This is the same representation, but based on the uh, starting relative levels of these compounds. As you can see here, they increased in the in artificial chromoplasts, but they further increased when these artificial chromoplasts were promoted to, to develop more plastic globules by exposure to highlight. Another way of promoting plastoglobular uh, development is by uh, over, uh, over expressing, over producing proteins that are associated to plastoglobules like uh, VT1, which is uh, an enzyme involved in the production of uh, tocopherols of vitamin E. In this case, by uh, co-infiltrating uh, 
the leaf with CRTV and VTE and exposing the, the, the leaf to high light, we could uh, further increase the amount of vitamin E because as I told you, VTE is involved in the production of these sensors, but not the levels of vitamin E or vitamin K. And this is probably because the, uh, the amount of plastoglobules in the, in the artificial chloroplast uh, of this treatment was already saturated and by producing extra VT1, we could not increase the amount of these uh, plastoglobules. But in any case, this uh, strategy also illustrates very well that the, uh, the storage capacity of the, of the plastoglobules is not saturated. We can even increase the amount of plastoglobular uh, metabolites by promoting their biosynthesis uh, uh, under these conditions. So yes, we can increase the uh, amount of isoprenoids by promoting PG uh, development. The good news is that this, this system for the for biofortification uh, of leaves in, 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 in vitamins is a system that is stable. Uh, this is the, also the work of, of, of Luca, and he observed that uh, up to two weeks uh, before uh, agro infiltration of, of leaves, we could still see a very clear phenotype of uh, carotenoid overaccumulation. We also checked that uh, the, the chromoplasts were uh, present in this uh, tissue and they, they were, so they were not returning back to chloroplasts. Once uh, carotenoids were accumulated, uh, they stayed at very high levels and uh, the, the chromoplast uh, differentiation was set and was not uh, reversible. Uh, chlorophylls also uh, showed uh, at the beginning they did not change, but uh, at later stages they decreased and this resulted in a carotenoid to chlorophyll ratio that was uh, increasing during time and that resulted in a, in a very strong uh, yellow color in the leaves. But as I told you, this yellow color never uh, disappeared. Okay, so no uh, reversion to chloroplast was observed. So the phenotype is stable. Another good news is that uh, this system can be exported to things that we can actually eat, like lettuce leaves or even like zucchini. This work was uh, carried out in collaboration with Jose Antonio Daros, who created viral vectors to deliver the CRTV protein to uh, different tissues. As you can see here, these are the lettuce leaves accumulating very high levels of beta-carotene. As you can see here, this is the quantification of the carotenoids present in, in lettuce leaves. Uh, this is a control with an empty virus and the overexpression CRTV uh, increases the amount of all carotenoids, but in particular, uh, beta-carotene was very highly increased. We could also apply what we learned in uh, benthamena, we could also apply it in here in, in lettuce. For instance, we learned that uh, highlight treatment in, improves the, uh, or the or, or triggers the, uh, the proliferation of, of cluster globules, and this creates a, a, a better environment for the accumulation, not only of carotenoids, but also of tocopherols. And as you can see here, the uh, exposure of lettuce leaves to, to highlight resulted in an increase in beta-carotene and also an increase in, in alpha tocopherol. And remember that these leaves are not uh, transgenic. They are not expressing anything, but just exposed to highlight. This is sufficient to uh, increase the, or to improve the, the nutri nutritional composition of the leaf. Of course, if we promote the differentiation of artificial chromoplasts and then we expose the, the, the leaves to, to highlight the amount or the increase in the amount of uh, carotenoids and coverals is even greater. Okay, to sum up uh, the main conclusions of the work to this point, uh, we could demonstrate that chromoplast differentiation could be induced in leaves by increasing the, the activity of, of PSY to levels that were high enough to trigger the, this differentiation process. And this could be achieved by using the, the bacterial CRTB protein. Then we also showed that uh, this artificial uh, differentiation of chromoplasts uh, could lead to a, a good storage place and a storage and, and production 
place to uh, the uh, accumulation of beta carotene alpha tocopherol and, and phylloquinone, important uh, isoprenate vitamins, and this was mainly due to the proliferation of plastoglobulus. And by further promoting this differentiation of plastoglobulus, for instance, by highlight, we could also increase the levels of these vitamins uh, with a mechanism that also works in lettuce. Okay, so all these strategies are based in creating a, a new production storage site in leaves based on the uh, differentiation of artificial chromoplasts. But we also thought that uh, carotenoid accumulation could be, uh, you know, could be increased to levels much higher if we moved to a different compartment in the cell, the cytosol. And in this case, we took advantage of the uh, presence in the cytosol of a, um, a biosynthetic pathway that produces the exact same precursors used for carotenoid biosynthesis in the cytosol by a pathway that is different from the MEF pathway. In the cytosol, this pathway is called the MVA pathway. As I said, it's completely different from the MEF pathway, but it produces the same precursors that could be used to produce carotenoids. These precursors are used normally for the production of esterols, but we can divert them to produce uh, carotenoids such as uh, beta-carotene. Uh, to show that this was possible, this is the work by, by a former postdoc in the lab, Trine Anderson. What she did was to exploit the nicotiana benthamina system to produce several uh, uh, enzymes that were necessary to produce these uh, carotenoids in the pathway. Specifically, she used a plant uh, enzyme with HNGR activity. HNGR is the main uh, rate controlling step of the NVA pathway. So we overexpress this enzyme in order to produce enough precursors to produce carotenoids, but also uh, without disturbing the production of normal isoprenoids that are produced from this pathway. And she also uh, uh, expressed bacterial genes required to transform these MVA derived precursors into uh, carotenoids, in particular to phytoin and lycopene. These phytoin and lycopene uh, carotenoids are also produced in the chloroplast, but in the chloroplast, they are immediately transformed into downstream carotenoids by the endogenous enzymes. So we reasoned that by, by uh, creating these uh, tocopherols in the cytosols, they will not be transformed into uh, downstream carotenoids. They will be easy to spot. And on top of that, they are also uh, interesting from the nutritional uh, point of view. And so it will be interesting to enrich leaves in these uh, carotenoids because in nature, the only sources of these uh, carotenoids are uh, some the, the chromoplasts or some tissues in which the uh, steps downstream of phytoin are downregulated, as it is the case of tomato. Okay, so Trine uh, tested different uh, combination uh, of these enzymes, as you can see here. And uh, her result showed that, uh, yes, these carotenoids could be produced at very, very high levels in uh, agroinfiltrated leaves. And as you can see here, the, the combination of all genes uh, produce levels of uh, lycopene and phytoin that were similar to the amount of carotenoids that are produced naturally in the chloroplast. So the cell produced the same amount of carotenoids out of the chloroplast that it produced naturally inside the chloroplast. And actually the amount of uh, lycopene was so high that it could crystallize and produce crystal that were that could be uh, visible in, in the microscope this is a, an image that we use for the for the cover of the journal in which this this work was published and as you can see here the chloroplasts are like these uh, green balls you can see here and this like red bar is a lycopene crystal accumulated in the cytosol of these cells so very high levels of carotenoids can be produced outside the chloroplast the next step was to add the gene needed to transform lycopene into beta-carotene, and this was performed by, by Luca uh, again. And he demonstrated that by doing that, we could uh, increase the levels of uh, beta-carotene fivefold relative to the levels of beta-carotene that were already present in the chloroplast. Okay, so we can 
uh, answer yes to the question if we can improve biofortification by using these staples feeder sites for uh, biosynthesis of storage of carotenoids. The question now is, can we combine this strategy with the artificial uh, chromoplast uh, differentiation strategy? Can we improve the amounts of beta carotene by in producing it in the cytosol, but also stimulating the development of chromoplast in the, uh, from, from chloroplast? And the answer is yes, we can. Uh, this is, this is a, a summary of the results. Uh, this is a combination of genes uh, required to transform a chloroplast into an artificial chromoplast. Basically, is the uh, overexpression of PRCTV. In this case, the, the enrichment in beta carotene is threefold compared to uh, GFP controls. And if we combine this artificial chromoplastogenesis with the uh, cytosolic production of beta carotene, we can reach an 8.5 fold increase in the accumulation of this provitamin A carotenoid. And at the level of all carotenoids, the increase was 2.5 fold. And don't forget that by doing this, we can also increase the amounts of uh, phytoin, lycopene, vitamin E, and vitamin K. So this strategy allows a multi um, biofortification of leaves in, in this uh, healthy or nutrient uh, uh, relevant. Uh, products. So we can we know how to produce lots uh, of these compounds, but producing more is not uh, a guarantee that our body will take more of these compounds and will use them productively for uh, to promote health. In order to do that, an important concept is by accessibility is how much of the nutrient, in this case, the carotenoid or the or tocopherols or, or philokinone, was released from the fruit matrix and loaded into micelles in order to be absorbed by our, our body. So if we produce lots of, uh, let's say, beta carotene, but we produce this beta carotene in, in a place in the cell where it's not bioaccessible, where the, our body cannot extract it from it and use it productively, then it's like, like doing nothing is like we never uh, uh, increase the, the levels of this compound. So it is in, it is important not only to increase the amount of this uh, uh, isoprenase, but also to make sure that the new places where these uh, uh, compounds are formed are places where these uh, metabolites are by accessible. So methods to measure bioavailability, bioaccessibility, sorry, are usually methods that are performed in vitro. And there are several, but they are not a general of general use in biotechnology or molecular biology labs uh, as ours. They basically start with lots of tissue and use um, methods that are not familiar uh, for us. So what Luca did was to adapt one of these bioaccessibility uh, estimation protocols to what it's normally uh, available in a molecular biology lab. He adapted this protocol, it's already available in methosensimology. And by using this protocol, we uh, addressed the question of whether our, the, the, the isoprenes that we're producing in our artificial systems were more by accessible or not. And this is, this is a summary uh, of the results. So let's look at the uh, beta carotene, which is like the, the uh, orange uh, bars in, in this graph. Situation number one is like the control what is the bioaccessibility in a, in a normal leaf is like in, in our condition, in our uh, experimental system is about 3%. If we produce this beta carotene in the cytosol, this bioaccessibility almost doubles. If we produce this beta carotene in artificial chromoplasts, the bioaccessibility is even higher. And if we combine the two strategies, we also combine the advantages of uh, producing beta carotene in the cytosol or in the plastoglobules of artificial chromoplasts. So the bioaccessibility is even greater. So by combining this strategy, we not only get much more beta carotene, but the accessibility by accessibility of this beta carotene is much higher than the one that we had at the beginning in, in chloroplast. So it's like multiply.
time not only by 8.5, but probably by several uh, orders of magnitude in terms of how much of this beta-carotene eventually reaches our cells. This bioaccessibility also increased by these different strategies for total carotenase and for uh, phytoin. And, could, and we could even uh, make it better by exposing these leaves to highlight. This, this is represented here by the uh, light color bars. Uh, this is like uh, the bioaccessibility of highlight treated tissues compared to tissues that had not been treated with uh, this highlight uh, exposure. And this demonstrates that uh, the accessibility of phytoin or beta carotene or total carotenase is increased by highlight exposure because plaster globules are good for bioaccessibility. Bi Everything that is stored in plaster globules is uh, more bioaccessible. In the case of lutein, we did not see this uh, increase because if you remember, lutein was not being stored in or produced and stored in plaster globules but it was stored in, in, in other members, in envelope and on other members. And that explains why the uh, treatment with highlight doesn't improve by, by accessibility of lutein. Okay, and just to sum up uh, all the, the, the results of this, this talk, this is what I uh, uh, summarized before. We can induce the, the differentiation of chromoplast release by overexpression CRTB. These, uh, chromoplasts, uh, artificial chromoplasts are enriched not only in carotenoids but also in tocopherols and phylokinones in vitamins that are important for us and that are produced and stored in plastoglobulus. By promoting plastoglobulus, we can increase the amounts of these vitamins and we can also increase the amounts of carotenoids and potentially any other metabolites derived from uh, isoprene precursors by uh, creating artificial pathways in the cytosol. A good advantage of all these systems is that by accessibility of these compounds is increased when they, we produce them out of the chloroplast or in artificial chromoplast. And last but not least, uh, to acknowledge the people who has contributed to this work, our collaborators that have, I, I have been already mentioning during the talk, the people who has contributed to the work, the uh, members, the current members of my lab, and the uh, funders that are make possible our, our research. And of course, all of you for your uh, attention and your patience. And I'm of course open to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel, for such a great talk. Uh, now we will open the, the questions and as a tradition here, we, we want to start with the master students, PhD students that would like to, to ask uh, sure. something. So um, is there any, any question? Questions? Hi, yes. I have one. Hi. I uh, thank you so much for the talk. It's really interesting. My question would be like more at like a general one, not like into going into the details and all the biochemistry into it. But if we are talking about like, for example, commercialization and scaling up, if you want to like in in the market, like what would be like the best the best crop to do so, and also like. And do you think that would be a lot of uh, controversial, like around it, like people would people accept having that in the market, and like yeah, because now we are I'm increasing it because it would have like all this health benefit, blah blah, but like uh, what is like the long terms of it, like where what, when would it reach the market, and what would be the best crop? Thank you. Thanks okay. Somebody. Yeah. Thanks for your question. This is a very relevant, very good question. Yes, this is always a problem. As you know, in Europe, the, the, the regulation does makes this reaching the market very difficult because we are manipulating genes, we are using transgenes in, in a tissue that we can eat. So this is difficult to reach the market unless we deliver the genes in a, in a way that the, the, the DNAs or the, the RNAs, the, the nucleic acids will become, will disappear somehow. 
Okay, we are now exploring the use of nanotechnologies to do that, but I don't have clear results. And we again are waiting for the uh, regulators to tell us whether this would be acceptable or not. In any case, our system uh, produces or, or can be exploited not only to produce things that we can eat, but also to produce uh, like, a, like a bio factory to produce carotenoids in order to be uh, used for industrial purposes. I mean, instead of uh, making carotenoids from natural sources and extracting from natural sources, you can enrich the plants that we already know how to grow, you can enrich them in, in carotenoids. For instance, you could uh, cultures like tomato that we only take the fruits, we, you, we can enrich the leaves of tomato in carotenoids and then use this as a byproduct of the tomato industry to extract carotenoids. That's a solution that comes to mind. But also an important thing is that by doing this research, what we are, we are learning how plants regulate the production of these compounds. For instance, now we know that the plastic globules are important to produce and store these compounds. And I just showed you some data that exposing lettuce leaves to highlight, we increase the nutritional quality of these leaves. So this is something that it can be, I mean, uh, applied straightforward uh, in, in the industry without the need of any uh, genetic manipulation. So we're learning how to bypass all these problems that reality uh, impose on us. Okay, cool. Thank you. But and what it, what would it be like the best uh, lucky crop to to scale up this work? Uh, doesn't really matter. I mean, uh, I guess the limitation here is the, the to have a, a, a the delivery system of the of the genes or, but. I mean, you could use your favorite uh, cultivar. There is no um, particularly favorite. We haven't done a, a study of uh, different plant species to know which one is the most appropriate to, to this system. We haven't done that. We know that our CRTB uh, trigger chromoplast differentiation process works in every plant that we have tested to date. So choosing the, the best uh, system would be, you know, based on the particular uh, agricultural environment that you have in, in your particular area, right? So there are some plants that are better for your area, some other plants that are not yeah. performing good. So it would be a, a, this kind of choice rather okay. than a particular species. Yeah, cool. One, one last thing. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, just I want to ask about like, so um, when you introduce like the, the bacterial uh, enzyme into the plant, like the variant of it uh, into the plant, like would the cur would like the expression, like the, the final product expression would reach a threshold or or is it like would continue producing carotenoid or there is a threshold that it would reach and then, OK, there is no further improvement in that. OK. To know whether we have reached the threshold would involve to do more tests and uh, you know like improving the the different combinations of different expression levels of different we haven't done this a, a, a thorough uh, study in this matter but what i can tell you is that uh, we're using an agro infiltration technique and that involves that uh, the, the genes that we are putting in the plant are expressed uh, in the last 24, 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And then in a few days, there is nothing there. And still, we see that our product is still there. So we don't know if we have reached the level of maximum capacity. But what we know is that when we produce these compounds, uh, even if we, if the enzymes are there only a few days, the compounds are stable enough. The structures in which these compounds are stored are stable enough to, uh, you know, to be there for weeks. Okay, cool. Thank you. Is there any other question by the students or postdoc? Jungi. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. It's uh, very interesting and smart work. 
And I'm, I'm, I'm from Salim's group, I'm postal in, in his group. And I have one question, of, uh, actually I have several question. The first question is, it's really amazing the CRTB the could be commercialized to plastic. So did you try uh, the CRTB from other bacteria? No, no, we just, we just tried the one that uh... It was available to us. It was, was the one that I presented, the one from Pantoja and Anatis. No, we haven't we haven't tested other sources of CRTB. Oh, we did because... we did try different sources of PSY proteins. We used PSY proteins from tomato, from Rabidopsis, from melon, from cassava, and none of them worked as good as CRTB. So the second question is, uh, uh, how about the crit eye localization? It's localized to plastic as well? No. Uh, so all the, all the, uh, the, the bacterial enzymes are supposed to uh, localize, when expressed in plants, are supposed to localize in the cytosol. Because they are, I mean, they don't have a plastic targeting peptide to go to the to the plastic. And this is the case for CRTE and CRTI and CRTY. All, all the, the answers that we have tested, with the only exception of CRTB. In the case of CRTB, we did see that some of the protein goes to the plastic. And actually, in order to prevent the, 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 the plastidial targeting of this protein, we had to block the N terminus of this protein by putting their GFP. If you don't do that, somehow the protein manages to reach the plastid. So we believe that it's a, like a cryptic plastid targeting peptide in the, in the sequence of CRTB to reach the plastid. But this is, this is not the rule, this is deception. Normally, bacterial genes do not reach the plastid, they stay in the, in the cytosol. as well so uh i think because i uh i saw you just uh, study the uh, crtb or crti in in, in in green tissue so how about non-green tea no non-green tissues such as rice wheat the green like uh, kelly the yeah this has been tested by different labs worldwide and it it it, it works it works i mean and we that's why we use them because we know that they had been tested by other labs in different systems and they, they work and they produce more crotonoids in this case. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Okay, we have another question from the, from the chat. I will read it. It's from uh, Takehiro Osawa. Very interesting talk. I was wondering if you have considered to transiently express a cytoplasmic or plastic targeted bifunctional phytoensynthase lycopencyclase enzyme, MCCARRP, derived from carotenogenic fungus mucor sinneloides, particularly with a mutation Y27R, in order to completely remove lycopene substrate inhibition without reduction of its enzymatic cyclase activity. Okay, no, we didn't try this specific <laughs> enzyme, but it's a, it's a very good suggestion. We, we will. We have tried other uh, uh, fungal enzymes, bifunctional enzymes, in order to you know reduce the number of genes that needed to be introduced in the plant uh, to you know to create these uh, synthetic pathways. But we were not very successful in our hands. These fungal genes do not work very well in in leaves. Okay. Is there any other question? Salim? By the way, thank you very much. Really very exciting. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I, have, I have many questions, but I will ask only two. The, the first one, the, when you overexpress in the cytoplasm, you got the lycopene crystalline, and that's probably the major reason why you could accumulate such high amounts. Uh, did you check the fate of beta-carotene? Is it... Uh, also crystalline or where is, where is it sold? No, we, we're not sure, but when we overproduce beta carotene, what we are set in the cytosols are small vesicles that we didn't yes. see before. So 
we believe that it is it is being stored in, in vesicles. We don't know the nature of these vesicles. We don't know if they are coming from the endoplasmic reticulum or they are. Uh, we don't. We we don't know. But they are colored. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you need you need a sequestration. Yes. Of, of the carotene, the, the major. Yes, it must, it must go anywhere. Um, yeah, yeah, but. I mean, we expected it to be, you know, like stored in, in membranes, in the ER membranes or in the tonoplast or wherever. But uh, what we saw is are these, these little vesicles, but we don't, under the microscope, we don't see a particular color of these vesicles. So we thought maybe if they accumulate high levels of beta carotene, they will, they will look like orange, yes. but they, they don't look, maybe the, 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 the concentration of carotenoid in there is not high enough. To see the color, so we we're not sure. We we don't have enough data on that. It'll be very interesting to see where you know where it's stored. The the other question is to the plastoglobuli. I mean that these are really very beautiful structures, and, and uh, they usually have some phytoin in them. And so, on. but you have also the CCD4 activity. Yes. And I'm wondering. I'm wondering. You know, we still don't know what that true function of CCD4 in, in green tissues is. Do we? We don't know that. I mean, the enzyme is there. It is in plastoglobuli. It cleaves beta carotene, and uh, it determines carotenoid content in, in non-green tissues. Did you check, you know, expression level, anything related to CCD4 in your system? Okay. What we did. We have an Arabidopsis mutant defective in CCD4 and CCD1, we have the double mutant. And yes. we have single mutants, CCD1, CCD4. None of them showed any particular phenotype in terms of uh, artificial chromoplast differentiation. We can, inject, we can infect uh, Arabidopsis with a, with a virus to deliver CRTB, and these Arabidopsis plants are able to develop artificial chromoplast. The mutants, in the, uh, single or double mutant, showed the exact same uh, accumulation same. of carotenoids as the wild type. So my interpretation is that CCD4 is not relevant for the, uh, for the, for the differentiation of chromoplast in this tissue. This doesn't tell you anything about the, 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 the in vivo function of this protein, but what I can tell you is that it is not necessary for uh, the chromoplast uh, differentiation. And to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't cleave the carotenoids that we're producing there. So we didn't see any, to, with our techniques, we didn't see any obvious uh, beta-carotene degradation products in our artificial chromoplast. Yeah. So I don't know what's, what's doing there, <laughs> but it's not, it's not degrading beta-carotene. I mean, it's or at least at a complex, high levels. It is, it is a part of complex and principle required for plastic formation. That has, uh, I think, Bilal Kamara published that long, long time ago. And we know it is, it is cleaving carotenoids, at least in vitro, and there are studies about carotenoid content in seeds and so on, and in many fruits where you know yeah, how that's yeah. CCD4. But it seems to be blocked in, in green tissues. I mean, there, there must be something else that regulates its activity. That's... Hmm. Very interesting. And in green tissue, CCD is there, CCD4 is there, but none of the other carotenoid biosynthetic enzymes are there. So what is doing there? I mean, is this is this expecting some, I mean, some, you know, active... When you have, you have, you have phytoin in blastoglobulin usually. You have some beta carotene. I mean, under normal conditions. With very low levels. Very low levels, yes, yes. But I think that is a dynamic story also. You know, yeah, that's of course. The, the composition doesn't, doesn't stay uh, as of it course. is. It's very interesting. Okay, so thank you very much. I think other people should also ask now before. Yes, is there, there any other question? Someone else? If not, I, I have a couple of questions. Ah, I think Monica has a question. No, sorry. I... 
I don't know what happened. Well, I will I will ask my my question, um, Manuel. Um, so basically, all all the experiments you you show or all uh, these the uh, to to prove the system to to convert the the chloroplast into into a chromoplast, you you did or you employed a transitory expression uh, systems. Right. What what will you expect? I, I know that even with transitory, you can see uh, still the color after many days uh, after after the the genes di disappear, the expression and so on. But would you think that by expressing constitutively the CRTV, you will obtain a much better result thinking about the commercialization of a product? Okay, we, we tried to overexpress CRTV in Arabidopsis using two kinds of promoters, a constitutive promoter, 35S, and an inducible promoter. The constitutive lines, only some of them show this orange uh, phenotype, orange yellow phenotype, but they, they, I mean, the ones that were not successful in this phenotype uh, could not be recovered because they died. If you transform chloroplast yes. into chromoplast, you yes. forget about it. I mean, you're not doing photosynthesis, exactly. you're gonna die. So exactly. we could not recover these lines. We know that, that it works in Rapidopsis because those, those plants, I mean, could be seen. And we also see that the, the, the viral vector also infects Rapidopsis and also produces carotenoid uh, chromoplast differentiation, but those lines could not be uh, maintained. Regarding the uh, inducible promoters, we were not successful in uh, obtaining the uh, artificial chromoplast using these lines. Our uh, thinking is that we are not reaching levels high enough to trigger the process, okay? So when we uh, quantify the, the amount of transkits that we can uh, obtain in these uh, inducible lines after induction, the amount is much less than what you can get, for instance, with the agro infiltration process. So uh, we think that we are not getting to the threshold that is required to trigger the whole process. Actually, we tried. We tried uh, once to install the bacterial pathway in in rice. We got very very red kali, but we could not regenerate them. Mm. Yeah, you know, and that is that is the point. I mean, Ralph Felch expressed the psi and the thirty five s. He didn't see. Anything but but he saw something like like chromoplast like structures mm -hmm. in 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 Cali and I think also in roots. Mm -hmm. the, the major issue is to get to this level. And if you get to this level, you you are killing everything. Yeah, you cannot be too successful, otherwise you will kill it. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll kill it. So then uh, another question: which kind uh, so you use highlight? In this, in, in lettuce, in the wild type lettuce, to to induce the content of of carotenoids and uh, tocopherols. Mm, in this case, uh, what do you call highlight? Wh which in light intensity did you use to do so? Seven hundred from from seven hundred to one thousand. This is what we what we consider as highlight. Okay, and. Because of course, uh, I mean, at least in in the in uh, terms of carotenoids, it is not surprising that the carotenoids will go high or increase because they are antioxidants. Tocopherols the same. Uh, also, we know that uh, at least for carotenoid genes, the promoters they have light uh, responsive boxes, so they are induced with the with the light. Um, how 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 do you think we can use this, for example, in, uh, I don't know, um, yeah, for the overproduction of carotenoids, do you think we can use this kind of a strategy, for example, for vertical farms and things like that? Sure, why not? I mean, I don't see any, any the only problem is to reach the levels, the, the, the intensity levels that are required for this treatment. So we expose the plants for three days to this, this high intensity light. 
probably the energy that you would require for vertical gardens to be exposed to highlight for three days. I mean, that's a lot of money. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, if you will, if you could recover this money by enriching these these uh, plants in in this particular. You can market them. I mean, this is added value of these these cultures. But I'm not sure. I mean, you would need a, a marketing study. Yeah. But. Uh, I mean, it's feasible. I mean, you can you can do it, and 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 you can market this product as at least under the uh, European legislation, you can market them as uh, biofortified. Okay. By using highlight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, you would market them by uh, using special conditions, but yes, by using highlight. <laughs> okay. okay. So. I will ask for the last time if someone else want to do a one last question. I, I have I have one last question. Ah, okay. Uh, when you when you overexpect the psi, you didn't see chromoplast like structures. What, what can you come back there? When you overexpect the psi in Nicotiana, mm -hmm. did you also see chromoplast like structures? No. Mm -hmm. We were surprised to see like a 25% higher amount of, of, of carotenoids, but they, the, the, when we looked at the, uh, the uh, electron microscopy, all we could see were chloroplasts. And the, the, when we analyzed the photosynthesis of the leaf, we never saw like a drop in photosynthesis. There were some areas in which the photosynthesis was slower, but it was never like a, a, a like a drastic drop that we observed with with TV. So, I mean, I cannot discard in, in any particular area. You could trigger the formation of, of chromoplasts. But what we saw is that by using uh, by decreasing the photosynthetic activity of the chloroplast, for instance, by using uh, inhibitors of photosynthetic electrotransport, and then producing PSY, we could uh, uh, trigger the differences of chromoplast, which led us to conclude that any chloroplast, including chromoplast, can, be, can become a chromoplast if you remove the photosynthetic commitment of this plastic. Okay? So anything can, be, can become a chromoplast mm -hmm. if you have more carotenoid production and if you remove the chloroplast, the, the photosynthetic uh, commitment of this plastic. Very good. Okay, Manuel, thank you. Thank you so much for, thank for you. the talk. And yeah, we, we are staying in contact. Thank you. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manuel. See you. Keep in touch. Thank bye. You. Bye bye. Bye bye.